Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we are going to learn about a generalization of homology which takes into account other types of coefficients. This can be useful in various contexts. Uh, for example, there, there's a notion of homology with real coefficients and that can get you towards an understanding of smooth type behavior and integration on a space. And there's also a notion of homology with Z mod 2 coefficients, which we'll be exploring in, in great depth today. And it really gives you somehow more information about non-orientable spaces. So let's get to it. Let's just remember our ordinary definition of homology. So this is going to be homology with integer coefficients. So our chain groups were the summation over i of ni sigma i, where ni was an integer, and the sigma i was a singular n chain. And then we took a chain complex, uh, which was generated by such elements, and we took the homology to get our ordinary homology groups, which when we want to distinguish them from our homology with coefficients group, we're going to call them hn of x uh, semicolon z homology with z coefficients. Now let's get into the more general definition. So let G be an abelian group. We'll make a note of why we need it to be abelian soon. So we're going to let this nth chain group with G coefficients be elements of the form the summation over i of g i sigma i, where g i is an element of g, and sigma i from the uh, n-simplex to x is a singular n-simplex. Okay, so this is half of what we need to define homology. Uh, the other half of homology are these maps. So like before, in ordinary homology, we can define uh, the boundary of G sigma i to be equal to the summation of this alternating sum of uh, G times the faces of sigma i. So, you know, the, the j summation is just summing over all those faces, just like before. Uh, so, the coefficient of each face of, say, delta n is either g or negative g. Just like before, you either added n times the face or subtracted n times the face, depending on uh, sort of which face it was. And now since this uh, formula is defined in exactly the same way, it's exactly the same proof shows that, uh, like before, if I do boundary squared, I get the zero map. And so we get a chain complex. which I'll call C star of X with G coefficients. And anytime you have a chain complex, you have the, you have homology. So I'm going to define H star of X G to be the homology of the complex C star of X uh, with G coefficients. Uh, so here's just a note. We use abelian groups so that 
kernel of boundary n mod the image of boundary n plus 1 is itself a group. Right? In a, in a general, in a general maybe non-abelian group, uh, it could be that the image of boundary n plus 1 is not a normal subgroup. And if you're not a normal subgroup, then you can't quotient to get a group. So that's why we use abelian groups. So uh, most of the machinery developed works uh, just fine for uh, homology with coefficients. So for example, um, Meyer via torus goes through. And uh, cellular homology goes through. And in particular, it's going to be equal to the simplicial homology or singular homology. So a natural question is, which coefficients do I use? Well, this obviously varies. I can, if you give me any abelian group, I can contrive a situation in which that group is useful. But maybe I'll give you an example of some groups that come up often. Uh, one good group, which again, we're going to extensively study today, and I'll probably just call it Z mod 2, like that, because I'm going to be writing it a lot. So here's why you'd want to use Z mod 2 Z. Number one is simplicity. And most of the simplicity comes from the fact that signs disappear. One of the most annoying things in homology is remembering the sign of everything. And if you have some like weirder homology theory, which comes up all the time in uh, modern math, it can be sometimes hard to tell what the orientation of an object is when the object is, is very abstractly defined. So Z mod 2Z lets you not worry about that because 1 is equal to minus 1 in Z mod 2Z. Uh, another thing you could do to simplify your life is use Q because it makes torsion disappear. And finally, you can also take homology with R coefficients. And like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, this sort of captures analytic behavior Uh, and can be used for uh, an algebraic approach to integration. So both of these are under the umbrella of the RAM cohomology. Okay, but today we'll focus on Z mod 2 and how it captures non-orientable information and we'll use that to bootstrap things for uh, orientable spaces. All right, so first of all, let's just start with a calculation. Let's calculate uh, the homology groups of RP2 with Z mod 2 coefficients. Well, like I said, cellular homology is a valid tool here. You just need to remember that instead of each cell generating a copy of Z in the chain complex, 
Each cell is going to generate a copy of Z mod 2Z uh, in the cellular complex. So uh, recall RP2 has the following cell decomposition. So it's got two zero cells, V and W, which also appear up here. And then everything is sort of glued oppositely. This is a B, that's a B, this is an A, and that's an A. All right, so C0 of RP2 with Z mod two coefficients. I have two zero cells. And so it's Z mod two direct sum Z mod two. So this is V and this is W. C one of RP two with Z mod two coefficients is also Z mod two Z plus Z mod two Z. And this is generated by A and B. Let's go ahead and call this two cell C because C two of RP2 with Z mod 2 coefficients is Z mod 2, and that is generated by the single two cell C. Great. And now let's go ahead and calculate boundary maps. Uh, boundary of V, boundary W, 0, as usual. Boundary of A is equal to uh, W minus V, and boundary of B is equal to W minus V. Now, boundary of C, here's where things get interesting. Go around C, and what I see is uh, A, uh, let's make sure I got these arrows right. Yeah. You see, uh, <laughs> A minus B plus A minus B. I'm going around clockwise. It's not going to matter. I The best thing about Z mod 2 coefficients is, again, orientations don't matter. Minus B is B. So this is 2A plus 2B. But where, what is A living in? A is a generator of a copy of Z mod 2. And so 2a is 0, and 2b is also 0. So boundary c is a 0 map. And now, here's the good stuff. So h2 of rp2 with z mod 2 coefficients is z mod 2. So this is a big win. And I'll explain why soon. Um, H1 of RP2 with Z mod 2 coefficients. Uh, okay, you, you want to look at the image of the map coming in. That's nothing. And so I just need to look at the kernel. And the kernel is A minus B, which is the same thing as A plus B. And if you take Z mod 2Z and quotient out by A plus B, the group generated by A plus B, you get Z mod 2Z and H0 not a very interesting calculation. Just like in the uh, case for Z coefficients, this counts the number of connected components, except each connected component contributes a Z mod 2 as opposed to a Z. Okay, so why is the H2 a big win? Well, before, when you calculated with Z coefficients, H2 of RP2 with Z coefficients is equal to zero. And so, Z homology can't detect two-dimensional behavior of RB, RP2. Uh, I mean, it, it looks, you know, it, yeah, just, uh, <laughs> it, there's no information there for, for which to work with. But uh, here we get some non-trivial elements and, and we're gonna use this soon. Okay, and here's a more general example. So 
what is hn of sn with arbitrary g coefficients is always equal to g. Why? It's because the cellular complex, at least for n bigger than 1, for n equals 1, it's, it's also g, but it's a slightly different argument. Uh, this looks like no n plus 1 cells, a g generated by that n cell, and then no n minus 1 cells. OK, so the top element of hn looks like g. Great. So here's a useful thing for calculating um, cellular homology maps. So for computing maps in cellular homology complexes, the following is useful. So this is basically just generalizing the degree. If f from sk to sk has degree m, then the induced map on homology with coefficients is given by multiplication by n. Uh, so just in case it's not clear what that means, that means an element uh, g is sent to g plus g plus plus g. That's always a homomorphism of an abelian group g. And so this makes sense and uh, and so it gives you some kind of degree theory with g coefficients. And this is, it's very straightforward to prove. All right. So now let's generalize this RP2 example. So recall that RPN has a cell structure with an I cell for each uh, I between 0 and N. Now, we did this in one of the first classes, but I'll remind you that the attaching map is, so where does that go from? It's from the boundary of DI, that is, SI minus 1 to RPI minus 1. We have a favorite map between those two spaces. It's the two-sheeted covering map, and that is the attachment map. Uh, and just remember that this map is what you get when you quotient out by the antipodal map. So every point is identified with its antipodal point, and that is the two-sheeted covering map. OK. Now, the boundary map on cellular homology is the degree of this phi i map composed with this quotient map where uh, we have, okay, I'll, I'll just write this out, S uh, I minus 1 to RP I minus 1. And then I have this quotient map. Remember, the degree is you, you take the N skeleton and quotient it out by the N minus 1 skeleton. Uh, the N minus 1 skeleton, or the I minus 1 skeleton, uh, <laughs> sorry, the I minus tooth skeleton is 
RP I minus two, and this we've learned anytime you quotient out uh, an n skeleton by an n minus one skeleton, you get S K minus one I minus one here. Whew. All right, so now what is the degree of this map? What happens when we trace out? just say uh, the top cell of S I minus one. That's what we want to learn about because we want to learn the degree. Well, let me just draw a picture here. Here is S I minus one minus S I minus two, this is going to go down by this uh, phi I map and it maps the equator sort of to the equator here. You can verify that. Uh, the antipodal map preserves the equator of S N and uh, if I quotient out the equator by uh, the antipodal map, I get RP I minus two. And then finally, uh, when I quotient all of this out, I'm gonna get back to SI minus one, except I'm gonna be missing a little point here. And the point here is that we get a homeo on the top and bottom hemispheres. Of SI minus one minus SI minus two. Okay, so if I just restrict the top half, that's that already completely covers RPI minus one minus RPI minus two. Uh, and therefore, when I quotient out, I go to all of SI minus one minus a point. Okay, but these homeomorphisms differ. Oh, sorry, bottom hemisphere of two SI minus one minus a point. Uh, so the homeos differ by precomposition with the antipodal map. All right, so let's think of it. Remember, a homeomorphism always has degree one or minus one, because it needs to be an invertible map. Now, one of them has, say, degree one, and then the other one is gonna have degree one composed with the antipodal map. So, in the end, the degree of phi i composed with q is one plus negative one to the k. Remember, the antipodal map on s S I minus one has degree negative one to the I because there's I components in R I where S I lives. And so you're flipping, you're flipping I coordinates, right? Okay. All of this was to give us the cellular chain complex for RPN. So with Z coefficients, We have that the chain complex of RPN with Z coefficients is, okay, this breaks up into two cases depending on if N is even or odd. If N's even, it looks like it, it starts with multiplication by two and then it's the zero map 
and then it's multiplication by two, and then it's a zero map all the way down to, it, it just keeps alternating. All right, this is if n is even, and if n is odd, you get basically the same thing, except uh, the twos and zeros flip around. So here's a zero, and then a two, and then a zero, two. It ends the same way. Uh, oops. <laughs> so this, uh, this should be zero, two. Obviously, that needs to be the zero map. Okay. All that's to say, the homology groups of RPN with z coefficients is equal to z if k is equal to uh, yes k is equal to zero or if k is equal to n and they're both odd it's z mod 2z if k is odd and 0 is less than or equal to k, less than or equal to n, strictly between 0 and n, uh, and it's 0 otherwise. So in the end, homology with integer coefficients sees stuff in the odd degrees. Right? It, it doesn't see any sort of even behavior of RP2. On the other hand, So, like we saw before, the degree of the map determines what the multiplication map is on Z mod 2Z. So, C star of RPN with Z mod 2 coefficients is equal to 0, Z mod 2, Z mod 2. So every group is Z mod 2, there's a single cell in every dimension. But now, okay, the maps used to alternate between 0 and multiplication by 2. 0 multiplication by 2. But multiplication by 2 on Z mod 2Z is the 0 map, so everything is 0. And so, the homology groups of RPN with Z mod 2 coefficients is equal to just Z mod 2 if uh, this K is between 0 and N, and it's 0 otherwise. And the big win here is that I now see a bunch of stuff happening in all of the even degrees. So the next thing I want to do is show you a map that is detected to be non-trivial by Z mod 2 homology but not detected by ordinary homology. So before that, I'll just need a definition. So let X be a topological space, and A, a non-empty, closed subspace with uh, so that there exists a neighborhood that is an open set with N deformation retracting to, N, to A. Then XA is said to be a good pair. So the picture here is uh, that you know you have your big space X, you have a closed space A, and then a slightly bigger space N. So basically A just has some room to expand 
that can shrink back down to A if I wanted it to. Okay, so uh, for example, if X is a CW complex and A is a subcomplex, then XA is a good pair. Here's a nice theorem. Unfortunately, we're not going to have time to prove it, but it's, it's very useful. If XA is a good pair, then there exists a long exact sequence in homology of the form So I have Hn of A with arbitrary coefficients, Hn of X with arbitrary coefficients, and Hn of X mod A with arbitrary coefficients. Then it comes down to H n minus 1 of A with arbitrary coefficients. And this here, I star, is induced by the inclusion map. And Q star here is induced by the quotient map. And then finally, I have this boundary star map here. And that comes from the zigzag lemma. And this isn't too hard to believe, right? If I have an n simplex in A, and I can include it into X, and then when I take X mod A, that simplex gets crushed, and so the image of one map is contained in the kernel of the next map, so that's a long exact sequence. So let's apply this. Apply this to RP2, RP1. And I get H2 of RP1 with G coefficients. I have this inclusion map. H2 of RP2. Oh, sorry. This is, now let's do it with Z mod 2 coefficients in particular. Z mod 2 coefficients. Q to H2 of S2 with Z mod 2 coefficients. Oh, sorry. Let's first call this RP2 mod RP1. But what is this? Well, I'm taking the two skeleton of some complex and I mod out by the one skeleton. We've seen before that this results in a wedge of two spheres where the number of two spheres is the number of cells. So this is exactly S2. Now, what are these groups? This is zero. RP1 is the circle. This is Z mod two. And this is Z mod two. So, Q star, well, it's an injection from Z mod 2 to Z mod 2, and therefore it's an isomorphism. In particular, Q star, Q is not a null homotopic map. What is Q? Q is the quotient map from RP2 to RP2 mod RP1. So I have a map from RP2 to S2. And the natural question is, I have a map, is it really just homotopic to the trivial map? And here I've just shown you that it's not because it induces a non-trivial map on the second homology with Z mod 2 coefficients. Uh, note that homology with Z coefficients cannot detect this map. The reason being that none of the homology groups line up. Where can I possibly detect it? H0 doesn't help. Then I have H1, but H1 of S2 is 0, so no help there. And H2 of RP2, with Z coefficients, is 0. So there's no way I can detect this map using the fundamental group or with ordinary homology, but Z mod 2 coefficients do work. 
Great. So the last thing I want to do is show you a proof of a powerful theorem called the borsak ulam theorem. Let's make sure I spelled that right. Yep. And here is the statement of the theorem. For every map, G from Sn to Rn, there exists a pair of antipodal points x and minus x with g of x equal to g of minus x. This is quite a surprising theorem. Uh, there's you know two opposite points with the same exact value for any map. That's that's quite surprising to me. So most of the heavy lifting is in the following. Here's a proposition. An odd map F from Sn to Sn. So what do I mean by odd map? It means a map satisfying f of negative x is equal to negative f of x. So f of the antipodal point is the antipodal point of f of x. Uh, so if this satisfies this for all x, then f must have odd degree. In other words, the multiplication on the nth homology needs to be multiplication by an odd integer. So first, note that if f is odd, from a map from Sn to Sn is odd, then f induces a map f bar from Rpn to Rpn. And the way this goes is, well, maps descend to the quotients if basically uh, they respect the quotient structure. So you need f of uh, negative x to be equal to f of x. And what you have is that f of negative x is equal to negative f of x. That's odd. But negative f of x is equal to f of x in RPN. And so you can define basically just do the f map on RPN, and it works out to a well-defined map f bar. Now, uh, let, let me say another word about this. We have Sn maps to Sn with f, and then Sn maps down to RPN with this covering map, but basically what I'm saying is first you could do the covering map, and then I can do this map, the map factors through RPN, and this composed map here is F bar. This diagram is commutative, so F bar composed with P is equal to P composed with F. All right, so now let's look at what's happening on the level of homology. So uh, a singular n simplex, that's a map uh, sigma from a, let's call this an i simplex because I'm already using RPN, uh, delta i to RPN. And now I also have this covering map Sn above here. And note that a I simplex is always contractible. In particular, it's going to uh, land in the induced subgroup of pi 1 of p. That's the lifting criterion. And so there exists a lift here. So it's a map sigma from delta i 
to RPN. And basically what I'm saying here is you get two lifts, sigma one tilde and sigma two tilde. So you get two lifts, sigma one tilde and sigma two tilde. This is, uh, this is because SN is a double cover of RPN. So if you decide where to lift one single point inside of the simplex, you, the, you decide where to lift the entire simplex and uh, there's two choices for those points. So I wanna sort of make this ambiguity disappear. So I'm gonna define a map, tau, from n chains on RPN to n chains on SN. So now's a good time to note it, to say, uh, I'm just gonna write PN for RPN. And everything here is gonna be Z mod two coefficients. For the rest of the class, maybe I'll point out once or twice that we're using Z coefficients, but everything is gonna be Z mod two coefficients. I don't wanna keep writing it. So uh, this is a map of the RPN with Z mod two coefficients to the chains of SN, Z mod two coefficients. Uh, B, well, I need to decide where to send an I simplex uh, and it should be sigma one twiddle plus sigma two twiddle. So I have a simplex and I just send it to the sum of the two simplices in the lifts upstairs. Now, the important thing is that we get a short exact sequence. So here's how that goes. I have CN of PN to CN of SN. I have this tau map that I just defined, but also I have this P sharp map. Let's just call this tau sharp because it's a map on chains. Um, and this will come back down to PN. And I'll, I'll leave it to you to check that this map is injective uh, the, the tau map is injective and the p map is surjective, but I do want to show you that the image of tau is contained in the kernel of p. Let's just do the two maps together. So sigma under this tau map lifts to the two lifts, sigma one twiddle plus sigma two twiddle. But what's a lift? A lift is something that projects back down to the original object. So sigma one twiddle projects down to p. And so p sharp sends that to sigma and Sigma two twiddle projects down to P, projects down to sigma. So this is sigma plus sigma, which is two sigma. And remember, everything is in Z mod two coefficients. And so two times sigma is zero. Okay, so this really is a short exact sequence. Uh, and this is everything we need to prove the proposition. So as we've seen before, Short exact sequences lead to long exact sequences. So the short exact sequence of chain complexes leads to the long exact sequence in homology, which looks like, okay, so this is gonna look a little different in the top degree and the lower degree. So first I'll show you the top degree. Uh, it's, it's basically just take homology of every level. So this is going to be, uh, well, here is HN of PN to HN of SN to HN of PN down to HN minus one of PN down to HN minus one of SN, which is zero. And this here is HN plus one of PN, which is also zero. So this is for uh, at, at level n. And then for lower levels, uh, and let's just say we're not in zero, easy stuff happens in the zeroth level. A lot of these groups are gonna be zero. So I'll have hn of pn to, uh, so this is hi of pn to hi of sn, but this is a lower degree. Let me leave myself some room here too. This is H I of P N to H I of S N, which is zero to H I of P N 
to h i minus one of p n to zero. So this is that boundary star map coming from the zigzag lemma and the other maps are the tau star and the p star maps that we've defined before. Okay, now this group here, hn of pn, we know is z mod 2z. And so is hn of sn with z mod 2 coefficients. And so right here, this is an isomorphism. Similarly, oh yeah, I have an injective map from z mod 2 to z mod 2. What could it be? There's only one, and it's an isomorphism. Similarly, on the other side, this boundary star map is a surjection between z mod 2 and z mod 2. All of the homology groups of Pn are z mod 2. So this is an isomorphism. All right, and then similarly, I'm going to get an isomorphism here. Great. Now let's see how all of this plays with the F map and that F bar map. We get a commutative diagram. I won't prove that this is commutative, but it's not too bad based on how everything was defined. Zero to CI of PN to CI of SN to CI of PN. Okay, and now all the groups on the bottom are going to be the same. CI of PN, CI of SN, CI of PN. Here are the tau sharp maps, tau sharp, uh, P sharp, P sharp. And here I'll have this F sharp bar. Here I'll have the F sharp map and here I'll have the F sharp bar map. And now remember, anytime you get a, a map on the short exact sequence, the naturality of that boundary star map uh, constructed from the zigzag lemma tells you that you get a induced map on that long exact sequence uh, constructed from the short exact sequence. Okay, so by naturality, of boundary star, we get a chain map of the LES to itself. Uh, and I'll show you what that looks like up here. Down here, I will have F sharp bar, the HN of PN. And down here, I will have F sharp to hn of sn, and on all these other levels, I'll have hi of pn. Uh, oops, let me write this one over here. hi of pn, and hi minus 1 of pn, uh, and I'll get f sharp bar. Both of these, and the point is that these maps are all going to commute. Okay, so my first goal is to show you that F sharp bar is an isomorphism in all dimensions. And we'll do this by induction. And I'll skip the base case. So the base case is I is equal to zero is easy. It's just because the, uh, the map preserves connected components, and that's really all there is to H to, to H zero, right? Now, suppose it's true for H I minus one, then by the diagram above, like by the commutative square, I'll scroll up and then I'll rewrite it. So I want to use this square here hi of pn down by boundary star to hi minus 1 of pn. And I can map both of these by f sharp bar, f sharp bar. And hi of pn, boundary star, hi minus 1 of pn. 
Okay, now, this map is an isomorphism in all degrees. We learn that just because there's zeros around everything. This map is an isomorphism by inductive hypothesis. And so this direction is an isomorphism. It's an isomorphism between copies of Z mod 2Z. And so if you go around this way and you get an isomorphism, you must go around down and then right and get an isomorphism. And so this must be an isomorphism. And therefore, uh, again, if you think about all these groups are Z mod 2Z, so F sharp bar on HI of PN needs to be an isomorphism. So we conclude that F sharp bar is an iso on all I. Just keep going up by induction. All right, but what map do we really care about? We care about F sharp, uh, F star. Uh, all these should have been stars. It's, it's not a big deal. Okay, we care about the F star map. So also, by the other commutative square, the one relating uh, HN of PN and HN of SN, I'll come up here. So this square, uh, well, why don't I, why don't I just reason this here? Uh, we've just shown that this is an isomorphism by induction. Uh, and this is also an isomorphism. It's so just a copy of the complex upstairs. And so down and then down and then right is, uh, is an isomorphism. So right and then down needs to be an isomorphism. So by the other commutative square, F star from HN of SN with Z mod two coefficients to HN of SN, Z mod two coefficients must be an isomorphism. But before we noted a theorem, which was that this map is on the top level homology of SN. So it needs to be multiplication by some number. And whatever that number is, it just induced an isomorphism on Z mod two homology. If you ever multiply by an even number, you get zero on Z mod two homology. So F star needs to be multiplication by an odd number. And so that means F has odd degree. That's the definition. There we have it. So I claim that this was the heavy lifting in the borsak ulam theorem. Let's prove that now. So proof of borsak ulam. All right, so what's the setup here? I have a map G from SN to SN, so to RN be a map. Uh, and suppose that g of x is not equal to g of negative x for all x. We're trying to we're trying to show that such a point exists, so we're going to do it by contradiction. I'll define a map s n to s n minus one, and I'll call it f by f of x is equal to g of x minus g of negative x divided by the modulus of g of x minus g of negative x. And this map is well defined because the denominator is never zero because g of x is never equal to g of negative x. Great. Well, you could also check f is odd. So, uh, and, and so is, f restricted to sn minus one. So this is the equator here. All right, 
let me just draw a little picture here. I have a map here from Sn to Sn minus one. And when I restricted it to this equator here, I got an odd map. Okay, well, then F must have odd degree. But what I can do is continuously deform this map. So here was F, and I can say this is like F1. And up here, this point here is F0. So F is null homotopic. F restricted to Sn minus 1 is null homotopic. Ah, yes, and I meant F restricted to Sn minus 1 must have odd degree. So it has degree 0, a contradiction. So there we have it. The borsak ulam theorem is proved by contradiction. There must be points, antipodal points, which map to the same number in Rn. So this leads to some nice, uh, like, honest real world examples. For example, if I look at the borsak ulam theorem for uh, n is equal to 1, I learned that there are two points on the equator of the Earth with the same exact temperature right now that are antipodal of each other. So as far as you can be on Earth, and they have the same exact temperature. Moreover, I, if I look at n is equal to 2, I can see that there are two points that are antipodal on Earth, which have the exact same temperature and the exact same air pressure right now. And you could use any continuously varying quantity. You should come up with some on your own, and you get some really surprising results. So that's going to do it for today. Thanks, and I'll see you again next time.